Welcome back to Back to Pro Headquarters. Thanks again to those who sent in their questions from our question box for this Q&A series with Professor McGill. Today we'll be addressing those curious about our anatomy and why our spine is different than our other joints, such as our hip joints. So Professor McGill, can you share your thoughts on that? Yes, we have many different types of joints in our body for a reason. We have hinge joints, we have ball and socket joints, now, a ball and socket joint is designed to transmit and create power. Power is force times velocity. So high force, lots of muscle through a big range of motion and high velocity is what the ball and socket joint is designed to do. But we don't have a ball and socket joint in our spine. Instead, we have discs that are made up of collagen fibers that form rings. In other words, it's an adaptable fabric. My shirt is a fabric. But if I create stress strain reversals on the shirt back and forth like this, slowly the fibers will delaminate. However, if we want to build and adapt mobility, that's the type of stress that you can build or adapt in a disc. However, it comes at a price and it would then delaminate faster if you then added high load. So your training program really determines the kind of resilience you're building in your spine and you can't have it both ways. There's always a trade-off. So now let's go to the animal kingdom and uh, see what we can learn there. Isn't it interesting when you go to the uh, Natural History Museum and look at an, uh, one of the early mastodons, for example, you will find they don't have fibrous discs as spinal joints. Instead, they have ball and sockets. So we see here, this isn't a mastodon, this is a whale, but nonetheless, we see a socket and a ball because uh, a whale creates tremendous power in its spine. So it's using its spine like ball and socket joints. And if it had discs, it wouldn't do very well because of the amount of power being generated uh, in an adaptable disc. So they still have uh, ball and socket joints. However, uh, we don't, as uh, I said, and uh, we have to recognize that this has an advantage and a disadvantage. If we had ball and socket joints in our spine, they would be great for creating power, but they couldn't stand upright. It'd be like stacking a pile of oranges or a, a stack of apples and a, a, a asking them to bear a load. They would fly apart. Mm -hmm. So the discs create a certain amount of turgor and stiffness to allow us to even sit upright, walk, do suitcase carries, and all of the things uh, uh, that we do. So let's consider now different types of activities as we examine that question of power. So if you are performing a deadlift, that is a high, very high force down the spine. You are more resilient when you reduce the power by reducing the movement. So it's much better in terms of spine resilience to lock your back because of the load being high in a deadlift. But if you want to play golf, you need the opposite. You have high velocity and lots of movement, but you don't use much force. If you use too much force, it's much more stress on the discs. And we certainly saw what happened with golfers when they got too strong. And now the whole trend in pro golf has gone away from uh, the power kinds of uh, strength training they were doing just a few years ago and they're uh, addressing their back pain in a much uh, more effective way. Um, think of jujitsu as an example where you need almost a reptilian spine but the grand family of jujitsu are the Gracies and if you ever have a chance to train with the Gracies what you will find is uh, their whole technique base is to avoid high force, to create the high mobility and if you're being submitted by a Gracie and you offer resistance, they will withdraw, change the angle, new position, come in and find another low force strategy to put that joint into a compromised position and uh, cause submission. So are you saying that those in pain might not be moving the best way for their anatomy? Uh, yes, I am, actually. Uh, back pain, uh, any kind of pain, is, is not random. The pathway is overload, and then we know the pain consequences of terrible psychological distress, uh, etc. In other words, pain uh, begets pain. 
But the curious thing about backs is the anatomy changes quite often uh, with injury. In other words, uh, the discs lose a little bit of stiffness and turgor, and they can no longer bear the motion. In other words, they start to experience unstable micro movements, as I'm showing here. One of the final experiments we did at the university, we took uh, people uh, mostly who had whiplash trauma, and the medical conclusion was there was nothing wrong with their spines and their, their, their spine pain was more in their head. It was a psychological uh, mechanism. And yet uh, we abandoned the MRI approach and we took a video fluoroscopy approach, which was a real-time moving x-rays. We watched their spines move through the range of motion. Then we saw as the spine moved through the mid-range, one of the joints would clunk because of the loss of stiffness due to the whiplash injury. And as their spine clumped, uh, there was their pain mechanism triggered from the uh, uh, micro movement. So, you know, this idea that uh, the uh, injury is not seen on an MRI, therefore they have no injury, is almost always incorrect with the appropriate diagnostic procedure, and quite often we find that pain without using any imaging at all, uh, we will determine what the mechanism of the uh, injury is, even though it was uh, not visible or noticeable on a uh, MRI. But anyway, that's why we have uh, different joints in the body, but they all come at a cost. And if you violate the rules that govern each joint, chances are that joint will become painful. Hmm. Very interesting. I hope that some of you found that interesting today as well. And we will see you for the next video with Q&A with Professor McGill. Thank you.